we're going to kick off, this is lovely. Um, thank you very much to, for coming. Um, oh, sorry, no. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, we really appreciate that it's the last day of the South by Southwest Perspective. It's past three and it's three thirty. Um, that there is a guy from Twitter talking in the next room. So I'm actually amazed that you're all here. Thank you so much. This is the session, as we said, that works better if you guys are closer together here at the front. So if you're sitting in the back and you'd like to move a bit closer to us, we'll really appreciate that. Let us introduce ourselves, first of all. Um, we are Bernard, there. Um, Belen, thank you. And we'd like to welcome you all to our session. Good. That's called Put Yourself Mobile Usability Testing, and that's the Twitter hashtag and all that stuff. Um, just in case you didn't guess that from the title of the session, this is a session about usability testing, which, according to Mr. Jeffrey Rubin and Mrs. Dan Chisno, is a process that employs people. People. So I wonder where can we get some people? Yeah. So it looks like you are the only people in this room, so we're going to have to ask you to help a little bit. And for that, we have put together a very strict and very scientific screening exercise that I'm going to ask you to go through with me. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to stand up. So please, everybody, can we have some light so we can see them a little bit? Everyone, please stand up. Come on, we don't have a whole day. The next thing I'm going to ask you is to take out your cell phones so we can see them. Cool. Now, the next step is pretty tricky, so please pay attention. Ready? If you don't have a US cell phone with a data plan, please sit down. Ah. Interesting. If you are from Austin or you live here, please sit down. Ah. If you don't like beer at all, sit down. What? What? <laughs> and finally, this is highly scientific as you can see, sit down if you're absolutely terrified by the idea of being our test subject. Yes. Really? Oh Come God. on! <laughs> so Bernard is going around, he's going to pick one to you. Don't sit down in the middle. I just saw you. <laughs> we got one. Now you can relax. You can sit down. Thank you so much. testing session. Look at the poor guy. The prototype we gave him doesn't make any sense at all. Um, we used an interactive prototype for this um, particular test, but uh, you can also test uh, software that is in production and it has already been released. You can also use paper prototypes and that's something that for mobile works quite well because you don't need to worry about, about how to put the prototype into the phone. But this is not a session about prototyping, and for the purpose of this session, we're going to assume that you have either a piece of software or some sort of interactive prototype that is running on a mobile phone. As you saw, we often record our usability testing sessions, and this is why. Because we have like a backup, a backup to our notes that we can go and check if there are any questions about what happened in a specific session, and because video is also a very powerful communication tool. So I don't know about you, but what has happened to me in working with clients is that even the most skeptic people, even the people who doesn't want to believe, who don't want to believe that their software might cause trouble to users, will actually accept the reality when they are faced with real people having real trouble doing real things with their piece of software. And it's because video constitutes unequivocal evidence of the existence of usability problems with a piece of software. But, Personally, I record also for a third reason. 
And it's because video has proved to be also very powerful in generating empathy between the design and development teams and the people who are, they are developing and designing for. You see, the end user is like a blob. It's like an abstract entity. It has no face. But when you show the development team or the design team clips from usability testing sessions, all of a sudden, that abstract end user gains a face. And these things happen, this switch happens in, in people's brains and they start, people start saying things like, oh my god, you remember the girl who couldn't find the button? Do you think she would find it now? Do you think she, it, it, the button is where she would expect it to be now? So this is a really powerful effect. And we have, I, I have tried to generate this effect in the past with personas, but to be completely honest with you, where my personas have failed miserably, I've been successful by using video clips from usability testing. And that's why I try to record every single session I run. What do we record? We record, excuse me, actions and reactions. <coughs> Sorry. We record what, what people are doing with the software, which are the clicks, you know, or the touches. And we record the reactions of that software, which happen on the screen, and the reactions of the person who is doing the test. And we people react with our faces, and that's why we record facial expressions. <coughs> I'm really sorry. At this point, I have a confession to make to all of you. Doing usability testing for desktop software is pretty much the same as doing usability testing for mobile software. Only that not really. As always, when you throw mobile into the equation, there is a few still challenges you have to deal with. And simplifying the whole story a little bit, these challenges can, to be, can be reduced to three quick questions that you're going to have to answer before you run any usability testing with mobile devices. Which phone, which context, and which connection? Now, if you're expecting me to give you the right answer to these questions, I'm going to have to disappoint you guys. There is no answer. There's no fixed answer to these three questions. It 100% depends on what you're testing and what, and what are the goals of your test. But there are a few things we can tell you about these three questions that hopefully are going to help you to make the right decision. Let's start with the first one. Which phone? These here are the results of a little experiment that Nielsen, the Nielsen Normal Group ran back in 2009, which in mobile terms is like at least the same or something like that. Um, what they did were, was they got 50 people and they asked them to do a few things with um, their phones on a few websites. They calculated the task success rate, and then they broke it down by the type of phone that people were using. And what they found was that if you were using a featured phone, something like a Nokia 6300, sorry, something that has like a smallish screen and a numeric keypad, if you were using one of those phones, you were able to complete 38% of the tasks. If you were using a smartphone, something like a Black Marybone that has like a bigger screen and a QWERTY keyboard, then you were able to complete 55% of the tasks. And if you were using a touch screen phone, something like a HTC Desire, where the screen is much bigger, and what you do is you interact with the phone, mainly touching the stuff on the screen, you were able to complete 75% of the tasks. And at this point, you might be wondering, why is this girl telling me all this stuff? Well, there is a moral to the story, and the moral is that the usability of the handset is going to affect the results of your test. So, you know, it's not only, it, when we are doing tests with um, desktop computers, like desktop computers, yeah, they might find different operating systems and different software installed in them, but they are all pretty similar. They have a keyboard and a mouse and they're sitting on the desk and if you get a person who normally uses Internet Explorer on Windows and you give them a Mac computer running Firefox and you ask them to do something in the browser, chances are they're going to be pretty much fine. This doesn't happen with phones because phones are not that standardized still. There, there's still huge differences. You know, it's not only the size of the screen, it's the input mechanism that you can use, it's the, the, the capacity of the phone. And of course, the software that is powering that form, you're very consistent. So if you get a person that normally uses a Blackberry and you give them an Android phone, chances are they're gonna have a very hard time trying to um, do the tasks um, because they don't really have familiar with the phone. So we need to find a way to minimize the effect of the Answers on the test results. And this is how. If you can run always the tests with the participants' own phones, the phone might be horrible, but 
but it's true participants own horrible fun. And they probably have, have workarounds already about how to deal with their horribleness. Um, if this is not possible, then sometimes it won't be. What happens if you're develop developing an app for a specific platform? You cannot reduce the people you're going to test with, with the person, the people, to people that have that fact, right? Um, or imagine that you're doing like a prototype that only runs in this specific fact. Well, if you cannot use your participants' own phones, you should include training and warm-up tasks. And those tasks you will do before the test, and they'll allow the participant to get familiar with the device. They are, they're get used to the device they're going to be using. So let's go to the second question. Which context? And this question is this, about this old controversy, about where should we run tests? In the laboratory or in the field? And, you know, this, again, with desktop software, this question is not that important because between an office and your lab, there's not such a big difference. Both a desk, a keyboard, and a mouse, and a room, and a person sitting in a chair. So it's more or less fun. But with mobile, it's a different story. We use our mobiles everywhere. We bring them with them into the toilet. You know, we use them in very noisy places, in badly lit places, when we are doing other things at the same time, like watching television and stuff like that. So really, the context of use of a mobile phone would be more different from the wonderfully lit, quiet, comfortable lab usability laboratory. So the way academics and experts try to work out what is best, testing in the field or in the lab, is running comparative studies. <clears throat> so what they do is they take this usability test, and they run it once in the field, once in the lab, and they count the amount of usability issues they find in this setting, and then they check, okay, which one, which setting reveal more issues. And I've taken some of these comparative studies, and I thought we could do another competition. So who thinks here that the field is better than the lab? Who thinks that the lab is better than the field? Cool. I'd love to talk to you about it. But anyway, let's see, let's see what the comparative studies from. So there you go. Here's both and his colleagues. The added value of evaluations in the field is very little. Ooh. Field zero, lab one. That's when people cheer. You know, when they're cheering. <laughs> Kai Conan and colleagues, there was no difference in the two test settings where well, the field is getting a bit in here. Field zero, lap two. <laughs> Nielsen, field settings can reveal problems not otherwise identified in laboratory evaluations. And now this is getting interesting. Field one, lap two. There were many more usability problems found in the field than in, that, in, that in the laboratory. The our colleagues. And really hot here, we have a time. <laughs> the reality is that these comparative studies have result that they are providing different results. We don't really know what's best. Expert discipline. But all of these studies seem to agree on something. The testing in the field Testing in the field is difficult, it is time consuming, and it's expensive. And the reality is that if you're working in an industry, probably it's a luxury that you cannot even afford. Because you normally, we normally work under heavy budget and time constraints, and we just don't have time to do this, stuff, right? So being really pragmatic, the reality is that testing in the lab is better than no testing at all. Right? Now, so for most of the stuff we do, like mobile websites, mobile apps, lab testing is just fun. Now, if you must do field testing, and sometimes you have to, what if you're designing applications that nurses are going to use to collect data about patients while they are visiting them in their houses? What about a mapping application or anything related to geolocation, even payments? This is stuff you totally, absolutely need to be tested in the field. Well, if you have to do field testing, do it late. Make sure that you have run lab tests beforehand, so you have, catch already, you have caught already most of the usability issues, and you have a piece of software that is already solid, and you're not, you know, you probably are not gonna change it that much. Plan, plan your head off. You know, is the location the right one? Is the equipment going to work the way we're expecting it? What's the protocol? How far is the moderator from the participant? 
How do they, how does the participant ask questions? How does the moderator ask questions, right? And be prepared, because field tests are <laughs> very likely to be disrupted somehow by um, field conditions like bus schedules and, I don't know, rain. So it is very likely that something is going to go wrong and you better be, you better be ready. So this is about the second, that's the second question. So let's go to the third one, and this is the Nisi one. This is about which type of connectivity are you gonna use to run your test? Are you gonna run over, running over Wi-Fi or over the mobile phone network? Well, this is a very simple. Never, ever run the test over Wi-Fi unless you have a piece of software that only runs on Wi-Fi. And there are some software, there is some software out there that does that. The reason, well, Wi-Fi networks are faster, more reliable, and have less latency than mobile phone networks. So if you test over Wi-Fi, you're going to miss the stuff related to performance, related to um, connectivity, and you know, you're going to miss all these things. And the second thing, that sounds silly, but it's actually, I think, quite important. When people come and use your software, they are spending money on data. So make sure that you cover the costs, right? You don't want to put so that's it. That wasn't that hard, right? But wouldn't it be neat that life, were this, life, mobile life, were this easy? Because the formula is incomplete. There's still one more thing, and it is this small detail of how on, how on earth are you going to record the whole thing? So we went, just remember, you of course could, sorry, you could of course, you know, not record tests. And some people don't record, just take notes. But do you remember why you record? You know, the memory aid and stuff, and how powerful it is to communicate the existence of usability issues, and all the em em empathy effects uh, video can have on uh, development teams. So really, it would be a pity not to record this stuff. So we went out there, and we looked at how people are recording their mobile tests. And we found that there are mainly four approaches to this. The first one is wearable equipment. And wearable equipment involves, like, hats cameras on them to record the mobile phone screen and microphones to capture sound and give instructions and unfortunately batteries to power all the equipment that you normally carry on bags. Now, <coughs> wearable equipment is cool because it allows you to test in the field and we just saw that sometimes you have to test in the field. But it is difficult to set up, it takes time, time and it's quite uncomfortable and quite the second approach is a screen capture, and this is how it goes. Do you install a piece of software on a computer, then you install another piece of software on a mobile phone, then you connect the computer to the mobile phone by a network, for example, Wi-Fi, and bam! You can see what's going on on the screen of the mobile phone on your computer. And this is pretty neat. There is another way that is coming up, and it's remote tools. There are at the moment quite a lot of remote usability testing services that for desktop uh, software, desktop websites, they are offering recording. Uh, so they record what's going on on the screen and they send it to you. So I checked um, those service to services to see if they would also do the same for mobile tests. And unfortunately, most of them they don't. They will capture information like time on tasks, success rates, click flows and click positions, and they will show them to you in nice graphs and, you know, heat maps and stuff, but they will not give you video of the session. Except this one, mouse flow. And mass flow is not a really a remote testing uh, software. It looks more like a, something that records the visits of people to your website uh, without them knowing, which I'm not sure, you know, uh, I might have some issues with this. Um, but they claim that it works in mobile environments like Android, Symbian, iOS, and Windows Mobile. And I thought, geez, I should check this out because it could be incredibly useful. So I put together a small form, I set up, Mouseflow has a free trial, so I set it up, it was just copy and paste a little script, and this is what came out. The first test I did was with a desktop browser, it was Firefox on Mac, and just to set a benchmark, set up a benchmark, and it is pretty cool. You can see everything that's going on. You can see where I click, what I'm typing, all the passwords still are protected, and you can see that I've submitted the form. Nice. So then I visited the, 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 the form with an Android 2.3.5 phone, and bam, it works. You can see me there. It's a little bit slower, but you can see me type in there, Android 3.3.5, oh, sorry, 2.3.5, sorry. So it is pretty good. 
it is a bit slower and you'll see the video is going to stop before I see it warm, but I consider this good enough. You see, you cannot see how it's in it for me there. But everything went to the town here from there. I have visited with uh, iPhone 3G that has um, iOS 4.01. And well, it just got a bit weird. It did nothing for about 16 seconds. And then when the first text field goes into, goes into focus, this is going to happen. And then you don't see anything else. And it just, you know, it's very clunky. I also visited with a couple of Symbian 3 phones and an Android 2.3.2 phone, and um, no visits were recorded. So this is a very interesting thing, but it seems to me that it's not there yet. So what is good about this approach? Well, at least with the traditional one where you install an application on the phone, this is going to give you really good, high-quality screen recording, and this is great. But it basically means that if you use one of these applications, you're not going to be able to run the tests with your participants on phones because people don't like you installing stuff they don't know what it is on their phones. It's also going to be impossible to find an application that is going to support all platforms. The one I showed you before, it's called Moviola, and it works on Blackberry and Symbian 3. And this is one that is offered by a company, Over Studios, and it works on iOS. But there is no such an application that works on Android, for example. And for touchscreen phones, this approach has another problem. And this is a video from Mobile Studios, and I don't know if you can spot what the problem if you can spot what the problem is. We don't have the fingers. <coughs> and that means that to understand what's going on, we have to rely on the very fleeting pressed state of the interface objects. And it makes it, this makes this really difficult to understand what is happening. I didn't normally use this type of software to run my tests, so I wasn't sure how big a deal this was. So I went out there to see what other people were saying, and it seems to be a big deal. Obviously, think aloud is critical because I cannot see how the participant is interacting with the fingers on the touch screen. And the good guys from CX Partners, with, which, who came up with a really cool setup for recording tests on iPad, are actually starting to doubt the value of recording this screen in this way. So this <coughs> seems to be a big deal. The third approach is document cameras. And this is it. You buy a document camera, which is a camera that is stands on a desk and records documents or a mobile phone screen. And this approach has been used by a lot of famous people like Scott Glaze and Google and Nielsen Norman Group. Um, and there's even remote services. This is usertesting.com. And they have a mobile testing service that is using this document camera approach to actually give you video of tests. I, I asked to do this test with the MIT uh, mobile website. I got the video back in about 15 minutes. It costs $31 per test, but you can get cheaper rates if you buy loads of tests. So I thought this service was pretty cool. I have nothing to do with this guy, by the way. I just tested the service and, well, it works. So the good things about using document cameras is going to give you pretty decent screen recording quality, and it's also very easy to set up. But document cameras are not particularly cheap. So if you are, you know, a bit stuck with cash, this might not be a good option. Although there are some cheap stuff out there. This is an iPhone camera. I have one of them. It's good. It works. But the main problem with this approach is that participants have to keep the phone within the document camera range. And you're going to normally, you're normally going to mark the range with something like tape on a desk. So imagine the situation. You have this guy who is already quite nervous and self-conscious because he's doing something you have called a test. Using a mobile website or a mobile application that I've never seen before makes no sense whatsoever while someone is watching. And on top of that, they have to make sure that they don't move the phone like, you know, they have to keep it within this funny square, because otherwise they're going to ruin the whole thing for you. So, you know, this is a situation I would like to put anybody. Maybe my worst enemy. <laughs> and then the phone has to be used either lying on a desk or um, at a really flat angle. Otherwise, you're not going to see anything. And this is quite unnatural. We don't use our phones like this. We use them like this. So it is a quite a natural position. 
So the four approaches mounted devices. And this is some sort of rig that attaches to the phone and has one or two cameras clipped to it. So it records the screen of the phone and sometimes also the face of, of the participant. And you have them ready made, you go buy them. And you have them DIY, do it yourself. And these are some of the ready-made stuff that you can buy out there. And these are the four illustrious uh, DIY mounted devices that were out there a couple of years ago when I started to research this stuff. Boy, things have changed. Now they're everywhere. Everybody's building this stuff, and that is just amazing. Mounted devices are really good because they solve the problem of docking cameras. They allow participants to hold the phone one-handed, which is a much more natural position. But if you buy them, they're not cheap. Now, to be fair to these guys, they probably sell you not only the rig, but all the other stuff you need, right? But still, it's not cheap. I couldn't afford this. Although, again, some people there to the rescue. This is very new, just came out in March. It is a um, mounted device that you can buy for three hundred. They're also, if you're doing them yourself, they can be a bit messy to build, especially how to put, to, how to synchronize and merge the different video sources that you're going to be using from the camera, from, from sorry, from the phone screen and from the face of the participant, this stuff. And if they're bulky, they can prevent people from using the phone single-handed. If they're heavy, they become really tiring for the participants, and I have seen this happen. So, when we got to this point, we look back and thought, well, all these solutions are great, but none of them seem to tick all the boxes. So we sat down and thought, okay, if we could have the ideal recording setup for mobile tests, how would it be like? What does it need to be? How does it need to be? And this is what we came up with. It needs to be easy to put together and cheap, so anybody can do it, including these small companies that are like a big percentage of the people doing uh, software for mobile phones. It has to be repeatable, so if it breaks, I can build a new one, new one quite quickly, or get a new one quite quickly. It has to allow natural interaction with the phone, that means that it has to allow people to hold the device when handed. It has to support all form factors, you know? It is great to build something that supports only iPhones or Android phones, if that's what you do. But, you know, here in the States, 50% of people still got make do with a feature phone. And maybe, you know, we don't want to exclude those people from our tests. So we need something that's going to work with all types of phones. That is going to allow you to run tests with your own, with the participants' own phones. That's going to capture the screen, face, and fingers, and it gives enough video quality. And this is important. What I'm looking for is something that I can use to take clips and show to my clients. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be enough video quality. And we uh, took the five different recording approaches that we just explained to you all, and match them against this um, set of characteristics. And what we found is that the first three approaches, wearable equipment, the screen capture applications, and document cameras have three red dots, and all the other, the other ones have two. So we discard those three straight away. Um, we were left with the mounted devices, and the ready-made look really good. It's only one problem, they're expensive. And unfortunately, there's absolutely nothing I can do about that. So I discarded that one too. So I was left with the mounted devices DIY, do them yourself, and I thought, well, if we could come up with something that is easy to build and it's easy to replace when it breaks, we might be onto something, right? So that's what we tried to do. And this is the spirit. We, this is, this is the, the, the frame of mind, we, we, we went about the whole thing. This is an iPad stand that is built with pencils. Now, it's incredibly ugly. It's actually a bit silly, but it works. So when we started to build these, we thought, okay, we don't care how ugly it looks, how silly it looks, as long as it gives us what we need. As long as it works, it's fine. And this is what we used to build. Two mechanics unions. Mechano is what you call here an actor set. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so it's two mechanics unions, five and six strips, 11 holes strip, few screws and nuts, a jubilee clip, and this is the star also. This is, jubilee clips are amazing. 
a few HD webcam, a second USB webcam, a, few, a, U, a USB extension cable, some blue tech, which you call mounted putty, an Allen key, a mechanical wrench, screwdriver, Windows computer, and a screen recording software. And if you're really poor, come studio, it's open source, and free. So you can go and download it, although they take donations. And this is how And it's incredibly ugly and it's quite silly looking. But it works. So, at this point, we're going to call up our friend. Sorry, what's your name? Dan. Dan. A big applause for Dan. Put in my password. Don't talk. Close your eyes. I couldn't begin to set it right. No. 
So, what's wrong? <laughs> Why don't you tell us something about usability testing instead of interviewing me? <laughs> You're just making some time. You're totally making up some time. That's my fault, Dan. It's my fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we just find some time here while we built it. <laughs> so how how is how has been so last for you? I've enjoyed it. It's been great. Yeah, was it your first time? Yes. Yes. This was my first time too. I liked it. It's nice. Have you considered putting together these kits and selling them? Sorry? Have you considered putting these kits together and selling them? Not really, no. Um, you know, this is a bit of a um, our, our approach more yeah. is open source and just allow people allow people to do it themselves. Um, do you have the instructions? Yes, everything is yeah. all on the website, which is going to be uh, um, sent around. Um, and it really is, you can buy it yourself. I mean, of course, if you want our help, you know, please contact us. But um, it's not really a money-making um, venture for us. It's more just get this out and get people using it and making it better and changing it and mashing it up and uh, so finish. Ta -da. So Sorry for taking so long. On, the screen is the other way around. So we need to, to do some jiggery poker here. I'm going to go to options, video capture filter, and I'm going to mirror and flip this. The reason that we're showing yeah. you all of this sort of, you know, little changes is because, I mean, this is what you're going to have to do to, to get it set up um, the first time. So it's better, it we think, to show you than have you scratching your head going, how the hell do I do this? And this is the neat thing about Amcap. It's going to allow you to run more than one instance at the same time. So I'm going to fire this again. I'm going to go devices. I'm going to select the Philips camera that I have here. And this is going to show us that space. There you go. You're famous, Dan. You're on TV. <laughs> so there are a few things I want to ask you to do. Can you unlock the phone for me? So everybody can know my security no, code. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I love how you made that scratch proof. My phone is scratch. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why we put blue tag in it. And the blue tag is, the purpose of the blue tag is twofold. And the first purpose is to fix the phone securely to the rig. The second one is to avoid contact between, direct contact between the phone and the metallic pieces. That means that there is no damage to the phone. And I have no, I have not found any scientific papers published about the effects of Bluetooth on mobile phones, but after about two years doing this, I think I have empirical evidence that Bluetooth doesn't damage the phone. <laughs> now, I might have to publish a paper. Um, <laughs> and just to let you know, we have spent, I don't know exactly how many hours, looking to see which material is best, okay. uh, yes. both to protect the phone and to give it a certain adhesive you know, sticking to the, the mount, and the best has been blue tag. We have tried a lot of different things, so 
just to explain that. What I have here is a screen recording software. So I'm going to fire this. So we're going to be recording very soon. Here we are recording now. And we're going to give Dan something to do. And this, Dan, is what we ask him to like to do. Could you read aloud for everybody? Uh, you just moved to Austin to an old big house in Pemberton Heights. You love it, but there's a problem with mice and rats. The house is infested. Go to www.austintexas.gov uh, and find out how to let the local authorities know about the infestation. Okay, so when did you let it go? There's a big right. reflection there. Sorry guys, the lightning is not, the lighting isn't that great. So remember to tell us about what you're doing as you go so along. So I'm opening up the browser, I'm creating a new window. And I will Google for the solution. Oh, I have to go to the, the government website again. Yeah, Use would Google. you mind? <laughs> that be okay? You're really making this difficult. <laughs> <laughs> hey, free beer, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to hold the phone? Maybe that thing comes a bit easier? Not working at all? Nope. Uh, have you tried any of the links? Hmm. Well, we're going to leave it at that. That's a bit disappointing. <laughs> If you have any, um, any points on the, on, on, on the rig, was it heavy, was it uncomfortable, was it, was it okay it to use? It seems a little bit unstable, uh -huh. like, I, I think you should like weigh the bottom yep. of it so it's easier to hold. Okay, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, cumbersome or over, overbearing. Yeah, it seems fine. Good. Cool. Thank you so much, Dan. <laughs> Well, I have a 
absolutely nothing against uh, Texas, the Austin, uh, against the Austin Texas .gov website. Um, they have used um, um, flexible layouts and, and responsive web design techniques. The main problem is that the website in a mobile device is trying to download 1.5 megs of stuff, and that's why it's not responding so well. Probably coverage is not very good in here, and downloading 1.5 megs is a lot of the stuff, a lot of it. So that was part of the problem. So yeah, responsive web design is great, but you know, they have some other issues. So that was that. So I don't know what you thought, um, but before we leave, I'd like you to run our DIY rig against the list of characteristics of the ideal set to see if it matches all, if it ticks all the boxes, right? So let's start to easy to put together. We're burning today. It took a bit long. Sorry. But you know, he was able to be here in front of all of you, so I'd say we can tell. We can say it's easy to put together. <coughs> what about chip? Well, the whole thing came. The whole thing, like the cameras, the webcams, everything. <coughs> it came out about 96. 52 pounds, English pounds, which in dollars is about 150 bucks. So if you don't have, or if your um, company doesn't have $150 to spend on these, get another job. What about repeatable? Well, a good measurement of repeatability is how easy it is to get replacement parts. So. We got everything pretty much from Amazon. The two, um, the two web webcams came from Amazon. The uh, Meccano set also came from Amazon. We bought other spare parts in this place called Meccano Spares, which is an online shop where you can buy Meccano spare pieces, and they exist all over the world, which is pretty cool. Um, the Blue Tag and the Jubilee clip came from a DIY shop in the UK. The USB um, cable came from Maplin, which is an electronics shop in the UK. The, um, um, the screwdriver came from IKEA. And Cam Studio is free and open source. You can unload it on the web anytime. So what about the take repeatable? Because I think it's pretty easy to get replacement parts, right? What about natural uh, use of the phone? Allow holding the device and allows 100 use. But a good way, a good measure of this is how heavy this is. And this, the whole set with the cameras and everything comes to 125 grams. And to give you an idea, an iPhone weighs 137 grams, an iPad 680 grams, I weigh about 55,000 grams, and a blue whale, and this is a funny fact just for you. <laughs> so it does allow holding the device on 100 years. Supports all form factors. Well, we're not going to claim that we have tested these or built these for all phones in the world. We have built it already for a few phones, including candy bar phones with numeric keypads, candy bar, candy bar phones with uh, QWERTY keywords like BlackBerry, touchscreen phones like the Nexus um, S, and something that is a really weird form factor, which is touchscreen phones that have a QWERTY keyword that slides in the horizontal direction, uh, like the HTC Set or the Nokia 900. <coughs> and this is the rig built for one of those phones, which is probably one of the most awkward form factors in the market. So, I'm going to be, I'm going to put a ticket there. Runs tests with participants of phones, but you saw that we pick Dan at random. We don't know who we don't know who he is. We just pick his phone at random and we could build it for it. So, I'm going to put a ticket there. Captures the screen, face, and fingers and gives enough video quality. But this is the type of thing you can expect. And it's not perfect. I'm not going to claim it's perfect. But I would be happy enough to show a clip of this to my clients to illustrate a point or a usability issue. This is another video with um, uh, Nokia E66. And if you have video edition software, you can also handle change of direction of the time. So I'm not going to be taking that. So there you are. And that's it. But before I go, I'd like you to um, think about something that is the reason why I've gone through. We have gone through putting all this set uh, together. You see, when it comes to desktop software, I think we can, we maybe can afford 
not to do usability testing. You know, uh, we have experienced designing Nextbox software, um, we have done it before, and there is a well-established set of design patterns that have been proven to work across different platforms. Mobile is different. Mobile is very new, change is incredibly fast, we know very little about the mobile context of use, which is quite complex, and there is no set of patterns, of design patterns, that have been proved to work across all platforms. So the only way, really the only way, of creating useful, usable, and beautiful mobile software is to validate your designs with your users. So go do it. It's 150 bucks, now you know how. So go get back on Monday to work and do it, and we promise to do the same. Thank you very much. So we've got a little bit of time left. If anybody has any questions or criticisms or anything we'd love to hear, there are microphones, I think, somewhere. Um, come up and challenge us or give us some tips or anything. You said that the back, you said that the slides would be available. Are they posted on your site or? Yes, they. There's a link at the very uh, beginning of the presentation, which we will we'll put back up again. Um, and we'll also, yeah, we'll stick it on Twitter with the uh, with the hashtag, and you can get it all there. Um, and that's a wiki with lots and lots of information um, and more going up after the talk. No more questions. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Um, so I'm a developer, and I was just wondering, um, with mobile applications, the development process is really quick. Um, where do you guys see usability testing play a role in that? Like, do you test it every cycle, or um, you know, do you wait to release before you usability test? For some thoughts on that? Absolutely not. I mean, for me, usability testing has to become a habit. Talking to users, validating your design has to become a habit. That's something that you do every 10 days. You know? And you can start with paper. You maybe don't have a prototype yet. Maybe you have uh, some mock-ups that you have drawn on a piece of paper. You just start with that. And you just make sure that as you design, you build feedback from users in that process. If you can do it every week, even if it's with three people, that's fine. But that is the way of really getting value out of this. Et ta main, t'es gonflée, hein? T'es venu fou. Mais ça va. Assistif. Tante Tu vois, tante Ah! 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 Please do, if you have any questions, just let us know. Uh, the, 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 the way it's been so if it's very 